Good morning, members and friends of Calvary United Methodist Church. We welcome you to our online worship this morning. We are pleased that you've joined us, and we pray that you are blessed as you learn about our preparation for forgiveness. That was a bit of a new one on me because I don't usually think about forgiveness as something that I'm preparing for in the season of Advent. But as the week would have it, it was on my heart a lot, thinking about my own need for such forgiveness and about the joy that God has given me in being able to realize that I am forgiven. When the angel came to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, he said, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And the guilt that we often carry because of the sins we have committed gives us great pause. And actually, the devil has a right to accuse us because we are typically guilty of those sins. But God came in the form of Jesus that he might erase that, erase the guilt of our sin and the punishment for our sin. And so we do have cause to rejoice today. And our opening hymn will be talking about how we are to rejoice because of the good news of Jesus Christ. But just by way of announcement before we begin to sing, we did want to make known to uh, you all and to the community that the Living Nativity is a go, and that will be next weekend, next Friday evening and Saturday evening, drive through only. But we are so pleased that those who loan us the animals are willing to take part in that, and the actors are going to be practicing uh, physical distancing and uh, caution as we present this for the community. So we invite you and we invite you to tell your friends and neighbors to drive through and to see and hear about the true meaning of Christmas. And we also wanted to lift up prayer requests uh, for families who have lost loved ones this week. It has been a very painful week in the life of Calvary United Methodist Church. And we pray for the families of Richard Hagen and Floyd Banwiller uh, as they uh, mourn and transition their loved ones into heaven. So our opening hymn today will be number 224, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. Ox and ass before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear of endless bliss. News, news, Jesus Christ was born for this. He hath opened heaven's door, and ye are blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian friends rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. News, news, Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save.
Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Travis became busy with his career and began taking his girlfriend for granted. He thought that regardless of his behavior, uh, his girlfriend would be there, even when he was mean or rude to her when he was in a bad mood. And then he went too far. I accused her of something, says Travis. She was crying, telling me I was wrong. But I yelled at her and told her to leave me alone until I decided what the truth was. And I said some really hurtful things, like things that made her feel uncomfortable being here, his apartment, when I knew she was too tired to drive home. And that I didn't want to marry her because I wasn't sure that she was the best I could do. It turned out his accusations had been wrong, but the damage was done. His apologies went unheeded, and they broke up. Would bring up something that he had done, some wrong that he had done against her in the past, and he had to apologize all over again. Travis kept waiting for the forgiveness that seemed like it would never come. Have you ever been in Travis's shoes? You blew it. You knew that you had blown it. And you apologized and you asked for forgiveness, but the other person refused to forgive. Or they said they forgave you, but they kept bringing up Uh, past hurts, and they wouldn't let the offense go. I've been there. I've been there. And it's a painful place to be, to know that you've blown it, to know that you need forgiveness, to wait for forgiveness, and not know if it's coming. And it's really painful when you realize that you have sinned against God. And you wonder, can God ever forgive me? If you're waiting for forgiveness this morning, during this Advent season, I have good news for you. Jeremiah 31, 30, uh, 31 through 34 has that good news. Forgiveness may, ne- may not be as far away as you think. Forgiveness is not something that you have to wring out of God's tightly clenched fist. God wants to forgive you. In fact, he wants to forgive you even more than you want to be forgiven. As hard as that is to believe. He's just waiting for you to acknowledge that you need forgiveness. And then receive it from him. You see, that's really the problem, isn't it? We, we don't believe that we've, have, we've done anything that we need to be give, forgiven for. And we, when we don't think we need to be forgiven, we don't ask for it. Now, you get a hint of the truth that God wants to forgive us in these verses in Jeremiah. 
through Jeremiah, God is speaking to the tribe of Judah just before they were to be led off into exile in Babylon. They had sinned against the Lord. They had rebelled against him. And so now they were going to experience <clears throat> punishment. So we pick up his words in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. God delights in making covenants. A, a covenant is a, a solemn agreement that defines a relationship and lists the benefits and responsibilities in that relationship. And God had been making covenants really ever since Adam and Eve. He made covenants with people throughout history. And when God makes a covenant with someone, God keeps that covenant. He's a covenant-keeping God. He keeps his promises. But now there is a need for a new covenant with Israel and with Judah and with us. Why? Because humans aren't as trustworthy as God is. We break covenants. God always keeps them. We break them. In verse 32, we see the problem with the old covenant that made the new covenant necessary. The new covenant will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. After God had led the people of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, he established a covenant with them. We find out what covenant God is talking about when we turn to Deuteronomy 4.13, part of the Pentateuch, part of Moses' writings. Moses is speaking to the people of Israel just before uh, they are to cross over into the Promised Land. All of Deuteronomy is, a, is, is really a sermon or a series of sermons given to them just before they take possession he says, and the Lord declared to you this, his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, that is, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. We know those covenants, don't we? There was a very gracious lady who was mailing an old family Bible to her brother in another part of the country. And the postal clerk asked, is there anything breakable in here? And the lady answered, only the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are breakable, aren't they? And not only are they breakable, but, but Israel broke them. Again and again they broke them. They chased after other gods. They made and worshipped idols. They used God's name in vain. They profaned the Sabbath. They dishonored their parents. They coveted. They lied. They even murdered. You name the commandment, it, it had been broken. Lucky for Israel, God did not have a three strikes and you're out policy. Yes, God did punish Israel when they disobeyed, but when they repented and asked for forgiveness... God always gave it. Always. And now Judah was, was facing big-time punishment in Jeremiah's day. They would truly be God-forsaken. Or so it would seem. When God punishes his people, it is not to destroy them. It is not to ultimately forsake them, it is to bring them back to their senses so that they will come back to him and he can restore them into a relationship with him. When, when they repent and turn back 
to God, he will take them back. Not only God will, take them, will God take them back, but he will initiate a new covenant with them. They broke the old one, so now he's going to initiate a new one. And he says, listen to this. Here's the features of the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So here, in essence, God is reassuring Israel. He says, during those dark, dreary, dreadful days of exile that, they, that feel like they will never, ever end, take heart. I will not forget you. You're still on my mind. I am purifying you. I will make a new covenant with you that will be better than the first. And how will it be better? It will be a covenant written on their hearts rather than stone. It will be a a direct covenant. It will be something within them. Moses descended from the, the mountain with the Ten Commandments written on stone tablets. They were good commandments. But they didn't have the power to enable people to keep them. You and I drive on, on highways um, in our state, throughout the country, and there are posted speed limits. And you see the signs all over the place. Speed limit, 55 miles an hour. That's the law. But those signs have no ability to help people keep the law. Those, those signs really are signs of our guilt when we exceed the speed limit. God's solution to the problem is to write this new covenant directly on our hearts rather than on stone. God will plant the Holy Spirit in each of his children, and the Holy Spirit will enable his people to keep the commandments. In addition, verse 34 tells us, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. No longer will God's people need a mediator between God and them. They will be able to do business with God directly because God will be living inside them in the form of the Holy Spirit who will teach them what they need to know about God and then empower them to to act upon what they know about God. And the really good news is that God will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. My friends, the new covenant that the people of Israel could only look forward to is here. We're already experiencing uh, that covenant We are living in the days of that covenant. It was initiated when Jesus was born in that that stable in Bethlehem. It was continued uh, and, and really sealed with his blood at Calvary. And it was established with power on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus' disciples when it came in fullness and allowed Jesus' people to spread the gospel throughout the world. 
The good news this morning, this Advent, is that we no longer have to wait. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is here. It is ready. It's here for the asking because God has given us this new covenant. It is here for the asking because of what God began to do, actually before the foundation of the world, but certainly showed us in that manger in Bethlehem. This new covenant is not only for the people of Israel. It is for anyone who is willing to turn away from sin, to acknowledge that they are sinners, and to come back to God, to acknowledge that they need forgiveness. Sin places us in exile. It it places us far away from God. And sin places us under God's judgment and punishment. But fortunately for us, God does not wait for us to find a way back to him. He takes the initiative. He doesn't wait for us to get, get our act together and work ourselves back into his favor. We couldn't even do that if we tried. No, God took the initiative and he introduced the new covenant that brings us back into relationship with him. He sends his Holy Spirit to convict us of our sin. And when we repent and when we ask for forgiveness, he gives it. He plants his Holy Spirit in our very life, giving us the power not to sin and to do right. It doesn't matter how many of God's commandments you have broken or how badly you have broken them. His forgiveness is offered to you now. But it gets even better. (laughs) I can't imagine anything better than that, but it does get better. Not only will God forgive your sin, but he will remember it no more. And I want you to listen to this carefully. Because this is important. And a lot of people don't understand this. God does not forgive and forget your sin. God doesn't forget anything. God is infinite in knowledge. He is infinite in wisdom. And so, so he cannot forget, forget something. He knows. Uh, our minds are limited, aren't they? Uh, we, we forget where we left our car keys or our glasses. Sometimes we forget where we left our car. Sometimes we, we forget important appoint, appointments. We forget our names sometimes. But God doesn't forget anything. So he doesn't forget your sin. He deliberately chooses not to remember it. Come on, Steve, what's what's the difference? Well, the difference is, is that he is choosing to treat you as if you did not sin. And he can do that because he sees Jesus in you. When he sees you, he sees his son who is sinless. And so he can remember your sins no more. He does not have to treat you as if you have sinned. So he remembers it, but he's not going to hold that against you. When God says that he will remember your sin no more, he is saying that even though your sin is retained in his memory, he will choose not to keep bringing it up to you. When God forgives you, it is done. It is finished. The matter is over. God moves on and he treats you as if you didn't sin. And so if someone keeps reminding you of your sin, that's not God. That is 
the enemy, that's Satan, trying to get inside your head and to drive a wedge between you and God. The devil is the accuser. He keeps remembering your sin, and he wants you to remember it. He keeps bringing it up. God wants to be in a holy covenant relationship with you. And if you haven't entered into this new covenant with God, there is no better time to do it than now. That's not really complicated. You just acknowledge that you really are a sinner, that, that you have sinned against God. And then you turn away from that sin. You say, Father, I don't want to sin anymore. Would you please forgive me? And when God forgives you, then you receive it. You, you take it, and then you follow Jesus as your master. So the, the one thing that I really want you to remember this morning is that nothing you have done is too awful for God to forgive. God's grace is greater than any sin that you can commit. But Steve, you don't know what I've done. I've done some awful things. You, you may have. But God's grace is greater than your sin. If you're saying that you've done something that God can't forgive, you're saying that, that there's some limit to God. Nothing you have done is too awful for God to forgive. If you have entered into this covenant by giving your life to Jesus, then you need to stop listening to the voices that keep telling you that you haven't done enough for forgiveness. Because it's not about what you've done. It's what God has done and showering his grace upon you. So stop waiting for forgiveness and receive it. Let's pray. Father, it's so, so difficult to really, truly wrap our minds around this idea of forgiveness. Because to be honest, we, we, the experience that we have with forgiveness is that it's so shaky. Other people seem to be reluctant to forgive us. Other people keep bringing up our sins. And so when we have that as our pattern, we, we have a hard time believing that you who know knows everything, can remember our sins no more. It's hard to believe that, that no matter how great our sin, no matter how awful we have been, you can and will forgive it. So Father, I pray that you will enter our hearts, that you will... Send your spirit to convict us of any sin that is there, anything that is um, unconfessed, and that you will draw that confession from us, that you will listen as we ask for forgiveness, and then give us give us the the willpower or the open minds and the open hearts to receive it and to receive your spirit. Lord, this Advent, there are a lot of hurting people. People who need your forgiveness, people who need to receive forgiveness from others. And I pray that you will bring healing Thank you, gracious Father, for this message from Jeremiah. 
that you will remember our sins no more. We pray this in the most excellent name of Jesus, our Savior. And we also pray together the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. Our closing hymn is number 230, verses 1, 3, and 4 of O Little Town of Bethlehem. for the benediction, I did want to give a special thanks to uh, our accompanist, Ginger Primrose, who has been faithful throughout the pandemic to be here and to provide music for us. Ginger, we thank you. And uh, we want to thank Chris and Jackie Campbell for all of their work up in the sound booth, all the learning along the way that we have done together as we try to uh, bring you the best that we can in online worship. So Chris and Jackie, we thank you as well. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Oh, come to us, forgive us. Oh, come to us, forgive us. Oh, come to us, forgive us. Oh, 
forgive us.